Welcome. All right. So cool to have so many people here listening to our panel. Let's start this way. After nearly a, more than half a day on intensive information. Um, <laughs> yeah, my name is Anna Rodewald. I'm partner at Green Room Voice, and we are curating the sustainability <laughs> launch here in C2. And today I have the honor to moderate this panel here on a topic which is from my point of view, very important for all our industry. It's uh, about uh, one piece of the new upcoming legislation into, in the U EU. And I invited for this panel three partners, professionals, who helped me to highlight this topic from different angles. We have Marie here from uh, Changes That Matter. We will have Kute here from Blue Sign. I guess everybody knows Blue Sign. And then we have online Tom. He's with us here. Can he, he see us? He, yes, he's up there. And uh, he's from Social Labor Come Against Program. And uh, before we start, I would like to ask Marie. The first, no, first we yeah, no, ask Marie first on uh, telling us a bit more on uh, what Changes That Matter is doing. And uh, then we continue with more details later on. Thanks a lot, Anna. So very pleased to be there with you to talk a very, about very important topics. Uh, so I'm Marie. Uh, I come from France. And three years ago, I had a shock about the environmental crisis and decided to create a network of consultant experts in sustainability. And our goal is really to support the world transformation in terms of sustainability, so moving to sustainable business model for uh, companies and organizations. Uh, today we have about um, 25 consultants across uh, Europe and we make sustainability a positive experience, uh, which is for us very important. And uh, one of our topic is the CSRG because we are convinced that we need several push uh, for several perspective and the push from the regulation is a key one. So very happy to be there. Who of you heard about CSRD? Uh, okay. okay, so <laughs> I don't have to t uh, tell that much about what CSRD is, but um, you might think on why we are talking about here about CSRD. And um, it is one very important piece inside the EU uh, legislation, and it should close the gap in all this regulatory uh, landscape. It should increase the accountability uh, of uh, companies inside the EU towards sustainability topics, and, um, and it should introduce a binding framework for, regu uh, for uh, reporting. And Having this topic here on the stage at performance days, where we have so many exhibitors in the supply chain and supply metrics network, and also so many designers and brand product managers and so on, we think it is important to highlight this topic from different angles and also uh, have the expert to um, give their insights, and we have, uh, at the end, enough time for you to ask questions. And continuing, saying that this, continuing with Kute on the, um, on Blue Sign, I guess it's not that much <laughs> to introduce, but probably you can sh uh, introduce your field of experience. Sure, I believe that we have a lot of system partners here at the show today and tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, that know Blue Sign, intimately familiar with Blue Sign. We are one of the leading sustainability service providers globally uh, with the idea of focusing on clean chemistry, responsible production and responsible use of resources so that the, we work closely with chemical manufacturers, textile manufacturers and brands with the idea of helping the chemical manufacturers manufacture clean chemistry, helping the textile manufacturers implement responsible production practices and use clean, that clean chemistry that comes from our system partner manufacturers, chemical manufacturers, and of course work with the brands to help them use uh, Blue Sign certified materials, uh, safe materials, so that they can provide safe products at the end to the consumers. So we focus on environmental safety, worker safety, 
resource efficiency, and uh, at the end of the day, consumer safety. That's what we do. Very important topics if we are talking about regulations and... And impact reduction, of course. Yeah, and reporting impact. Perfect. And then we have Tom. Tom has a complete different view to this topic. Uh, and Tom, can you introduce yourself and tell a few words what SLCP, Social Labor Combatants Program, is doing? Of course. Just checking you can hear me. We can hear you. Fantastic. Great. Well, it's great to be here um, virtually and um, looking forward to this conversation on a, a very important and timely uh, topic of CSRD. Uh, so my name is Tom. I'm working for the Social and Labor Convergence Program. Um, we're a global multi-stakeholder initiative uh, designed to uh, improve working conditions in global supply chains. And we do that by implementing a common social assessment in facilities in the supply chains to collect harmonized data uh, that's comparable globally um, and can be used for, um, for a number of different reasons. But one of the key purposes of, of collecting this data is for human rights due diligence implementation. And that's obviously very closely linked to um, the CSRD uh, disclosures as well. Um, so SLCP um, being multi-stakeholder, we represent a number of different um, stakeholder groups, including manufacturers, brands, non-profits and governments. And um, this is now, uh, the program's now scaled to be uh, having over 80 brands uh, accepting SLCP rather than uh, traditional social audits that they would normally use. Um, and th this means that over uh, 12,000 facilities uh, in supply chains are now using SLCP assessments rather than um, their own um, traditional social audits. Um, and that's uh, all in the context of reducing uh, the audit fatigue and burden uh, on suppliers, uh, which is uh, very relevant for implementing, uh, implementing policies such as CSID and CSDDD. Okay, um, another, thank you, Tom, another f a bunch of acronyms. Um, I guess there is no field in this uh, business where we have so many acronyms than in the EU, new EU uh, legislation. Corporate uh, Sustainable Reporting Directive, that's the main topic we will talk about. Um, and uh, also your name is, uh, your company name is, um, organization name is an uh, acronym. Um, Coming to Marie, um, Marie, you're working with a lot of companies in the textile sector, but also abroad. And um, why is it so important that we collaboratively work in the textile industry on these topics? Yeah, I, I would say so if we step back and think about sustainability, uh, sustainability means a very holistic approach. And that's the goal with this new uh, directive uh, in terms of reporting. Um, a new approach, holistic approach in like several ways. Uh, so that means first in terms of the content. Uh, so the companies will have to report on impacts, on risk and on opportunity regarding environmental, social and uh, governance. Um, we have already talked about this uh, various impact. So that's the first thing. A second thing is um, in terms of time frame. So with the new uh, reporting directive, you will have a more forward thinking. So that means shifting from a kind of more short-term perspective to a long-term perspective. So that's the second one. And third one, which is uh, very important for our uh, discussion today, is really shifting from a supply chain to a value chain perspective. And that means when we talk about value chain, we really take into account the whole ecosystem of a company. So that means starting from the upstream activities, the core activity, and at the end, the downstream activity. So having really this uh, world perspective. So that means that companies which are not perhaps directly um, impacted by the reporting directive will be impacted because of their customers, because of their uh, suppliers. And that means the company will have to report on it and will have to work closely with all the um, supplier partners 
to bring this transparency in terms of impact, risk and opportunity, and to collaborate, because it's not only reporting on the impact, it's also reporting of what do I do to reduce the negative impact and to increase the positive impact. So that means this work together is really key, and you can imagine that it's complex. Mm -hmm. What is so special in the textile industry? Yeah, so textile industry, I think it's, it's, I mean, in terms of this value chain, it's really especially interesting for me. Um, the first thing is with textile industry, we have huge complexity. I mean, you know it better. Uh, we have a lot of different suppliers, a lot of different activities. In terms of geographical sp scope, it's also very broad. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, we have talked about it in terms of the impact, in terms of the uh, environmental and social impact, that's very broad as well. So starting from the raw material to the textile fabric, sewing, so the transformation. So the wall, during the wall value chain, we have a lot of impact. Uh, you talk about um, the impact in terms of chemistry impacts so of pollution. We have also impact in terms of working um, condition with uh, child work, in terms of safety. We have also, of course, when I go more in terms of the environmental impact, in terms of greenhouse gas uh, emission. So to give you an idea, roughly, so the textile industry, it's between 4 and 10 person in terms of the global uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission. So it's huge. And that means when it's huge in terms of like negative impact, it's huge in terms of uh, opportunity to reduce this uh, negative impact. So that's why it makes it very interesting, I think. And it's a challenge for all of us to yeah. collaborate on it. Um, you mentioned social impact. Uh, that's uh, the field where Tom is the expert here in, in our panel. Um, Tom, can you tell us a bit more on how SLCP is, uh, what, what are you doing to support uh, the users of your program in regulatory compliance? Definitely, and uh, what I can do is maybe just start with um, one key fact which we're seeing in our data. So um, now that we have uh, 12, over 12,000 facilities uh, using SLCP, um, we have a very rich data set about what the actual issues and risks are in the supply chains, particularly in the textile sector. And what we're seeing is that over 90% of facilities are not even meeting basic legal compliance. And the majority of these issues are seen in health and safety, working hours and wages and benefits. And so that already just paints a picture of where we're sitting in terms of the scope of the risk. And as you were saying, Marie, like the broad nature of what types of risks we're seeing in not in only the working conditions in the facilities. Yeah. And that's just a very small portion of the broader risks that we're talking about and need to understand with CSRD. Um, in terms of what we're doing uh, for our suppliers and, and, and how we're helping them with compliance, I think there's probably three key areas where we really focus on uh, supporting uh, for compliance. And the first is really education about what the actual policy expectations are. Um, I had a meeting with a, a supplier who was traveling from India yesterday, and they're a very advanced supplier, but they really it really surprised me again that, that how overwhelmed and how much of a lack of understanding they have of what these new expectations are. And that's a real risk as well, because if suppliers are unaware of what's going on in the um, regulatory uh, space and also then un un unequipped or and, and lack the technical knowledge to be able to help um, get the right information to the right people, that's going to create huge inefficiencies and 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 distract really from what we're trying to do, which is actually help the suppliers to improve their conditions and and reduce the impacts on them. So, part of it is education. Um, the second is ensuring that our tool, um, the converged assessment framework, the the common framework, is actually useful for compliance. Um, so that involves doing mappings with CSRD and and due diligence legislations and making sure that the questions that we're asking of uh, the suppliers 
and the questions that we're 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 um, yeah asking as part of the tool are relevant and and actually aligned with the expectations of compliance and implementing good policy. So yeah, that that's another area. And then the last is uh, I think the, the the last key area would be ensuring that suppliers are actually playing a really active role in in the data collection and 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 the the data that they're supplying and. And for that, um, what we have is um, a, a shift from the traditional social audit model to what we're um, doing, which is um, ensuring full suppliers own their um, ESG data. And that means that they actually own the data that they share with the brand or, or they share with other stakeholders who need to then go and do the, um, the CSRD compliance or um, and, and, and that's a real shift in mentality as well, because we're actually truly um, putting the supplier and the workers at the center of their CS, of the CSRD compliance. And that really is a, a reflection of what CSRD and um, due diligence is about, which is actually understanding the impacts on in the facility and then helping them to improve it. And that's something that we're trying to do on a systemic level uh, through how we collect the data. Thank you, Tom. So that's a very deep insight in, again into the uh, topic, into the social topics. Mm. Coming back to the uh, environmental impact, could I, um, in, blue, in the blue, inside the blue science system, there's a lot of reporting already done. Mm -hmm. Many, many partners here on, in the in the fair working with uh, right. blue science since ages. Hopefully, how can all this data? help uh, or can be used uh, to feed into uh, the reporting re uh, requirements we see brands uh, facing uh, towards CSID? Sure. First of all, I would like to uh, mention something that you just mentioned. Sustainability is something holistic. You have to look at the entire picture, right? You said, look, let's, we need to look at the entire textile value chain. And that's exactly what Blue Sign has been doing for 23 years. We are a millennial. We were founded in the year 2000. That's exactly what we've been doing. We've been connecting chemical manufacturers, to textile manufacturers to the brands when you really wouldn't see all these partners, especially brands to chemical yeah. manufacturers, talking to each other. What this allows when you're using Blue Sign approved materials or making a Blue Sign product made from Blue Sign certified materials, you can track everything all the way down to the chemical. Blue sign approved chemical products using those materials. Mm -hmm. What am I trying to say is this traceability is a huge component of this reporting directive because it goes back to due diligence. Because what CSRD says in terms of the material um, impact, materiality, it says what is your business's social, environmental, and economic impact? Well, unless as a brand, fashion brand, apparel brand, unless you know your supply chain, there is no way to understand the impact in your supply chain. So traceability is hugely important. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, Blue Sign is not an audit system. I think this is very important to clarify. I know a lot of you are, are familiar with Blue Sign, but Blue Sign is a system, an action plan that you implement at a facility. What does we go assess the facility? Not an audit, because it's not a pass or fail. It's not a certificate. You're done. It's about where are you right now as a manufacturer, also chemical suppliers, as a manufacturer, fabric maker. Status quo. We take a look at environmental management at that facility, occupational worker safety at that facility, and resource efficiency, which these days we call the impact. Water consumption, energy consumption, chemical consumption, carbon emissions at that facility. We've got criteria for all of these. So we compare the assessment to where they are, to where they need to be, because we've got very strict environmental worker safety and resource efficiency criteria. And then we prepare an action plan with them to close all the gaps that we see. So essentially, that's why we call the Blue Sign System. That's why we call them system partners. Because if you're a system partner, that means that you're actually implementing the action plan so that we can bring your practices, production practices, up to the level of Blue Sign's expectations. Meaning, I said resource efficiency, carbon, energy, uh, water, etc., so on and so forth. Part of that assessment and the action plan is reducing that impact, working with those eKPIs. Now, what happens is the fact that when you're a system partner manufacturer, you get an annual impact report where we come, we come do the on-site assessment, we, we verify that impact data, 
and give you an annual impact report that the manufacturer can use to feed into the data into their reporting, or they can actually provide it to the brands that they work with. And in reporting, you can use any kind of data that you want, but the, the, the valuable, credible data is verified data. What does green claims say? For example, any kind of claim that you make has to be verified by a third party. Just like that, the data that you use in reporting, very briefly, has to be verified data. And that's why we come into the picture, because that's what we do with our, our partners. The, what you see on the screen is, separate from all of that, we have an entity called Blue Sign. I hope I don't get ejected from my seat. Okay. We have an entity called Blue Sign Academy. And Blue Sign Academy is the uh, owner of Blue Sign criteria, owner of the uh, Blue Sign uh, limits, and so on and so forth. And they also offer uh, consulting services. They're based in, um, uh, in Germany. What they do is they offer a sustainability reporting service to anyone who wants to work with the Blue Sign Academy. And you can follow all of the steps from planning to analysis to materiality uh, analysis, data management strategy, so all the way to the implementation. You can work with the Blue Sign Academy. We pull all that information into what you'll see this little blue box over there that says Blue Sign Reporting Tool, which is our internal tool. And then we can push all of this information out into the format that is required, such as GRI. So this is one of the services that we offer under Blue Sign Academy. You don't have to be a Blue Sign system partner or customer for this. So this would mean that uh, all the data which is uh, in this Blue Sign reporting tool, which is collected here, can be used by your partners, by your system partners to fulfill their... Anyone, any one of our system partners or anyone sitting over here who wants to work with Blue Sign Academy in terms of the reporting. So they, these are verified data which will be uh, good enough, uh, substantiated enough to feed into the CSID regulations? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Huh? And that's, that's, I think, the strength mm -hmm. of, of, of Blue Sign. So some of the, um, or big portion of the work might be already done. Because often uh, we hear that uh, suppliers are very afraid of all the reporting data, which is needed for the future. But uh, actually, some of that stuff is already available mm -hmm. in, in your system. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. So with the system partners, we already do the on-site assessments and, and look at the impact data mm -hmm. and then collect that anyway, and we provide that annually to our system partner manufacturers. Mm -hmm. we, also give, we also have got a second level, a tier two services, meaning you're not ready to implement the full Blue Sign system. I'm not ready for the action plan, right, as a manufacturer, but I want to work with Blue Sign on impact services, meaning then we just focus on the impact of your facility, water, energy, chemistry, carbon emissions. We go do an on-site assessment only focusing on impact, not worker safety, not environmental management, etc. Again, we call this impact services for the facilities who's just interested in this. Then we also provide those facilities with an impact services impact report, which then they can use to feed into their own reporting, or if they've, they've, they've got brands that they work with, obviously, to say, this is my impact report, and this is verified by Blue Sign, prepared by Blue Sign. Thank you. That is a very deep insight. Um, Tom, you also talking, you talked about uh, data, about a tool which you are using, um, collecting data with your partners. Can you tell us a bit more about it? And I guess you also prepared a slide, which we can use in the back side. Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, Next what slide, we please. do. Sorry. Thanks. Fantastic. So yeah, if you um, just click through a couple of times, you can show the the full slide. Yeah, great. So um, what we're doing at SLCP is we're implementing uh, the Converge Assessment Framework, which is a data collection tool that helps to um, collect data, which is uh, very granular on working conditions in the supply chain and. I think that what we're doing uh, is, is, is by implementing this common framework is um, ensuring that uh, the type of information we're collecting is truly not just about um, not just uh, based on one particular brand's expectations or um, one particular supplies, but a true industry uh, collaborative effort to collect good data. So if you Maybe if you jump into the next slide, I can talk a little bit more about um, the connection here with um, human rights due diligence. Yeah, so um, 
in the context of regulation, so of course we need to be collecting data to be able to help identify risks in the supply chain. And I think that that's a really important element of what we offer at SLCP is a, a data collection tool which um, collects data that can be used for human rights due diligence implementation. And that is obviously very well connected with CSID. Um, I think what's also really important and, and for tools such as SLCP, um, but also um, other uh, MSIs and, and, and tools in the industry is that we're really transparent and honest about what our data, uh, what our, our measures do or can do and what they actually can't do. And that's something that we've really tried to do in our human rights due diligence toolkit, which we uh, published last year. It's a really transparent reflection of what um, we're actually useful for and what we can help you with and what type of data we can collect, which is um, credible and actionable. And then what, what is actually outside of our scope and what do you need another tool such as blue sign or something to, or to, to, to help with. And that's something that I think that we really need to be mindful of as we move into this new era of um, growing expectations and demand for different types of data is that not every tool can do everything. And we're trying to make sure that we stick in our lane and, and uh, collecting good, credible data about the facilities, conditions, and the workers' experience at work in the facility at that time. And this tool already exists, so it's nothing which we have to invent new. It's something which is already available. Who can use this kind of tool? Does somebody have to be a member at SLCP, or how does that work? No, so we um, so the tool is publicly available. You can download it straight off our website if you'd like. Um, because what how the data collection process works is that it starts with a self-assessment. So a facility will simply be completing the tool, and the the, the version on our website is just in, in an Excel format. But um, nonetheless, that is one way you can do it, which is completing a tool yourself. And then the next stage is when you need the verification and that's where you need to get uh, support from a different technology partner, um, such as um, HIG or now Worldly, um, who offer that service um, uh, for us. Um, and that's something where you need to, the facility would then need to be engaging with um, a different technology partner to help with the, the, the um, uploading of the data and fitting that into the system. But ultimately it's a public, publicly, public uh, source. Um, the tool is publicly available and, and, and freely accessible. That's good to know. So we have a lot of tools, a lot of systems which are already here, which we can, which everybody can use to find their way through the jungle of all the data which is needed for the new uh, legislative um, uh, work which we need to do. Um, Marie, um, you talked a bit about uh, the key elements we need uh, to build the relationship with, uh, between the partners and the supply or value chain, as you said. It's a much better word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in terms of key elements or perhaps also the way to get started because, I mean, it seems like it's a huge work, right, uh, with different tools and kind of a lot of complexity. Um, so what we say to our customers is really to start first with this overview in terms of uh, value chain. So just mapping the different step of the, of the value chain. So you can start in a pretty yeah, simple way and having like the big steps and step by step going more into the details and trying to map your um, different activities. So that's the first thing. And this um, overview will help you to identify the stakeholders. And uh, here we talk more about the business or the suppliers' uh, partners. So you will have to kind of first have a global list of your uh, suppliers. And once you have it, you can start to prioritize these suppliers. So defining with which supplier is it especially important to collaborate. And here, I mean, of course, you will define some criteria to select them, but that's a first very important uh, part to have a prioritization. So with which supplier do I want to engage? 
And then it's a real journey. I mean, we talk about it with uh, the tools. It's a real journey. We talk about education, awareness, and step by step going into the collaboration. So work together and at the end really reaching a win-win situation. That's, I mean, it's a growing path uh, all together. So you have to see it on a very, really ongoing uh, journey in terms of uh, collaboration. And we talk about also the, the culture, uh, which is, I think, very important in terms of culture change, the way to work, and also having clear common guidelines in terms of transparency, in terms of expectation. I think that's a key element as well. What, what kind of challenges do you see? Oh, a lot of challenges. <laughs> um, I, I think um, we talk about the, the complexity uh, and the prioritization. So I think that's very important to first focus on the, the impact, the risk and opportunity, which are the most important. Uh, so of course, with the um, reporting way to do with the um, uh, the directive, you will have a lot of input to know how to prioritize. So I think that's uh, very important to answer this um, challenge. I think also it's um, um, in terms of going back to the textile industry, we, we have this, um, this complexity and you will have to deal with it with different standards, with different uh, countries. But the good news is that at least uh, with this uh, European uh, directive, we have one common framework, uh, which is, I think, a huge help to address this uh, challenge. And perhaps last but not least, we talk about it, which is more the, the change management. So really thinking about the transformation, the way to engage with people to uh, communicate. So I think that's a huge challenge and that's also a huge uh, opportunity. Same question to Tom. Um, what kind of challenges do you see in your work with your partners who's in this value chain? Yeah, I think um, Marie's already taken a couple of the ones I've already <laughs> mentioned. But, Sorry. Um, I think, yeah, definitely the fragmentation of policies is really creating a bit of a burden um, for the suppliers. Um, us, for, for, for in terms of understanding what, where to prioritize and what to do, um, where to start. Um, I think in terms of um, what I already mentioned before around the knowledge gap. So. There really is a lot of uh, a, a good common understanding of what is going on in terms of the policy expectations and requirements with compliance um, in, at a brand level. And, and, and in, in the EU, I think it's becoming much more common that you, you have a good understanding of this. But suppliers don't have a lot of knowledge in this. And this means that, that and they do want to, suppliers are telling us that they want more information about what's what, what they're supposed to be doing, where they're supposed to start. And this is something that we really need to ensure that not just tools and systems like us, but also regulators are actually helping to um, bridge this knowledge gap and, and ensure that they understand what is expected of them and how they're supposed to implement this. Um, and SLCP and, and amongst a number of other um, organisations um, were part of the public consultation at the end of last year with the um, European legislators when they asked, do we need sectorial guidances uh, now as part of CSRD? And we suggested that they would be helpful now because there really is a, a need for clear practical guidance around what is expected. Um, the conclusion has been that they will come over the next two years and that's uh, really a promise, that's good to see still. Um, but that's something that I think will, will really help uh, suppliers and, and industry stakeholders in understanding where they should be prioritizing and also how they can actually implement them and, and what is the expectation. Um, I think one of the other key challenges uh, really is about uh, the cost of this as well. So who's actually gonna be paying for the compliance and who's, who's paying for this new data that suppliers are supposed to come up with. And I think that um, the investment that's required, not just for CSRD, but more broadly on, on the European Green Deal into, into systems and processes and also technical expertise um, down the supply chain and our value chain uh, is uh, significant. And that's something that shouldn't be underestimated. So 
that cost really needs to be offset somehow or um, supported not just and, and not just put on suppliers. And I think um, systems and processes like that that are commonly developed and can create efficiencies and and, and reducing the, the the audit burden or the compliance burden are really ones that we need to be focusing on and uh, leveraging and scaling um, as we move towards this uh, growing demand of of, of data um, time that's coming ahead. Thank you, Tom. Um Anything to add from your side before, uh, I think it was before continuing with the questions <laughs> on the benefit? <laughs> no, I think challenges has been, yeah. have already been covered, mm -hmm. social and environmental in terms of reporting, what are, what is, what are the challenges that are facing us. Mm -hmm. uh, from, my pers from our perspective and my perspective, uh, the, the biggest challenge, working very closely with brands, I've got my coworkers over here as well, brand experts. One of the biggest challenges that we see is the fact that brands don't know their supply chain. They only deal with mostly with tier one, and then beyond that, it's all a, a fuzzy, uh, vague, what's going on over there. They've got some of them are, have got very few nominated suppliers, and the rest is handled through garment makers, sourcing offices, and whatnot. So th this requires full traceability. Both the due diligence requires traceability and also reporting requires uh, traceability. Unless you, you establish that, I think that should be the first step in terms of a homework or for the brands. And also that becomes, that comes as a challenge that they need to overcome. Which is again also an opportunity. Opportunity. Isn't <laughs> um, as we all, lo we, we love to work with people, we love to work together. So if we can collaborate on, on the challenges we have together, it's also a benefit because together we can make it much better. We can handle this kind of stuff. It's not, all this demands is nothing but one company, doesn't matter how big uh, this company is or corporation is, uh, can handle on his or her own. So from my point of view, the, uh, one of the biggest benefits is that this kind of demand forces us a bit or invites us to collaborate on those questions. Mm -hmm. And um, anything... What, what is the most positive aspect from your point of view? What is the biggest uh, benefit in this uh, regulatory needs and the need for collaboration? Well, standardization, because reporting, again, requires, dictates that you know your supply chain, understand the impact in your supply chain, and hopefully put forward actions to reduce that impact. This, the reporting directive standardizes that in terms of how it will be done by all the, the companies or the affected companies. And there are a lot of them. Uh, I was looking at some of the numbers from the reports. It's talking about close to, and we're not just talking about EU rules, talking about the non-EU entities making, uh, having revenues in Europe. And they were talking about around 10,400 10, companies, non-EU companies, three of them being American companies. So uh, the non-EU companies will be impacted by the reporting directive in 2000. In 2009, they'll have to start reporting using 2008. Uh, sorry, I'm going back 20 years. 2029, they'll start reporting using 2028 data, but it's going to impact everybody. So it's going to be the standardization in terms of where are you regarding your impact in your, uh, in your business, in your supply chain. And last word for Marie. Yeah, I, I see it from a sustainable transformation perspective. So I think um, for pushing sustainable transformation, we need several pushing perspectives. And I think the new directive is really a big opportunity to push this uh, sustainable transformation. So that means at the end, having a textile industry, which is bringing less negative impact and more positive uh, impact. And of course, for that, in terms of collaboration, we talk about it, that's huge. And that's, I think, not only with suppliers, but also with competitors. So really broader than the classical uh, collaboration. Wow, thanks for all that insights. Um, if I would uh, summarize it in a few sentences. I will take home, we need to collaborate, we need to learn about our partners in the industry, 
and uh, we need one language to talk uh, to our audience, to our supply partners, to our customers, uh, to have the same wording, to the same tools to use, and then making that will make life easier for all of us. Thank you for now for, uh, to all the three of you, and we have four minutes left <laughs> for questions. The microphone is coming. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm João Matias from YKK. And before I ask my question, just a little bit of context. So we are a two, tier two supplier. We have a lot of customers that buy products from us, and they have their own. They're either following uh, standards like BlueSign, or they want SCLP data, or HIC index, or um, Smeta, SEDEX, Smeta, or m 4 e BSCI, BEPI, Ecovadis, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of different um, uh, uh, standards out there, and a lot of duplicated work, which is a huge burden for us. Now, Great timing, Continue. because now my question is, um, how would the reporting directive and the due diligence directive help create a better convergence of reporting standards? And are all of these standards going to become one single thing, and anyone can follow any of those? Or what is happening? What's going to happen? Who would take the answer? I believe there will be some sort of harmonization that will take place in the foreseen future. I don't know what that will look like. I also investigated because I was also curious in terms of there are all these standards. Can we have one harmonized one? So I will let my uh, peers over yeah. here answer that question. I guess you've got more yeah. information than I do. So. I, I think you're right. I mean, the fact that we have some standards uh, within the CSRD, it's already a huge kind of gathering some of the standard together and bringing a unique standard uh, for Europe. So it's already the right direction. Of course, that doesn't mean that they will not still have a lot of different standards. And we talk about Europe and company which have uh, a lot of activities in Europe. But nevertheless, I think that's a first huge uh, step in terms of uh, standardization. But of course, you will have nevertheless like labels and so on, which are like part of it, but I think the, the direction is a kind of more standardization for simplification. I think <laughs> simplification is very important. Thank you for that question. And we have time for one last quick one. Hi, um, I'm Aline from Simpatex, I'm working in the CSR department. Um, I want to ask Marie for um, for um, other collaboration projects. We, uh, for example, are involved in a project from the European Outdoor yeah. Group to reduce the carbon product, um, uh, the carbon emission, and mapping suppliers and with other brands. And it's it's a very wonderful project. And do you have any other examples? Are there more out there? We don't know yet. So there are a lot we can talk perhaps after because it's, it's kind of specific in terms of what do you need. Um, but I think you have plenty of opportunities. So and at different level in terms of uh, cross sector, between a sector, focusing on different materials. So it's just defining what do you want in terms of uh, collaboration and you will probably find something. OK. <laughs> Sorry, it's very short because I know that. Uh, no. We, we have another you, three seconds, and uh, <laughs> with that, I would say thank you every, to everybody to listen. For more questions, uh, we are here for a few minutes uh, to ask directly, and uh, also uh, in the sustainability launch in C2, there will be enough uh, time to ask questions if you like. Thank you for joining, and uh, thank you, Kim, for moderating. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>